With an object of immense power and a direct course for Earth, Admiral Kirk resumes command of an upgraded Enterprise. Unfamiliar with his transformed old vessel and at odds with its former commanding officer, Kirk and crew race to intercept and learn the secrets of the mysterious intruder. Warping onto screens December 7th, 1979, Star Trek The Motion Picture marked the end of a decade-long wait for the return of live-action Star Trek. Highly anticipated following the recent explosion of science fiction on the big screen, the movie broke box office records and remained the highest grossing movie in the franchise, adjusted for inflation. But despite this, the film disappointed the studio as well as some critics and fans due to its slow pacing and visual departure from the show. But what happened? What did I like and what did I not enjoy so much? Before I get into this breakdown and review, please note this video contains spoilers, so if you've not yet seen Star Trek The Motion Picture, this might not be the video for you. Let's warp into this. Three Klingon battle cruisers investigate a large cloud of energy. The ships attack the cloud, but their weapons have no effect. The cloud retaliates, easily defeating and destroying all three ships. Meanwhile, a nearby Starfleet monitoring station observes the battle and learns that the cloud is on a direct course for Earth. A pretty strong opening all around. I do want to say on record that I love the film's overture and never skip it when I watch. I love that the director's edition has restored a Starfield to the piece as well, the absence of which actually resulted in most projectionists cutting the sequence from the movie on its original release. Are the visuals in this opening sequence a tad indulgent? I'd say so, but who doesn't love sweeping sci-fi visuals? I know I do. The action does an effective job of establishing the threat, as well as what Star Trek can look like with an actual budget. And yeah, let's talk about Jerry Goldsmith's score. Truly an exceptional collection of music, made even more impressive by the realisation that the whole thing was conceptualised and recorded in little over a week. I've always loved this score, but in adulthood, much like the movie as a whole, I found a new appreciation for it. It's easily the best Star Trek score of the lot, and now I think it's my personal favourite too. On Vulcan, Spock, in the midst of the Kolinar ritual, is distracted by something in space that an Elder discovers has stirred his human side. The Elder tells Spock he has not achieved Kolinar and that his answers lie elsewhere. At Starfleet Headquarters, Admiral James T. Kirk meets with Commander Sonak, a science officer due to serve on the Enterprise, which has been completely refitted and is now under the command of Captain Will Decker. Kirk reveals to Sonak that he has a meeting with a senior official and intends to be on the ship when it launches. The establishing shot of Starfleet Headquarters was brand new for the newest director's edition release, and it's fine for the most part. The producers of this new version, the same producers who put together the original director's version in 2001, appear to have taken a less is more approach, and these new FX shots are nicely spaced throughout the movie so as to not make it an overly jarring experience. I think they get the balance just right. The interior shot did look a little strange though, it looked like a collection of layered assets that were in different states of condition, which does give the visuals, to me anyway, a bit of an odd look. Pay particular attention to the tram as it lands and slides towards the camera. It just doesn't look right. Kirk meets with Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott at an orbital station who takes him to the dry dock housing the Enterprise. Scotty is concerned that the ship isn't ready and needs more time, but Kirk is adamant that they launch properly and reveals he is to take back command. The two enjoy an extended tour of the new state-of-the-art Enterprise before docking. What can I say about this sequence that hasn't already been said before by a million fans? The new Enterprise is the crown jewel of this movie, and rightfully so. It's gorgeous. There is one shot I'd take out though, which is the final passing shot which briefly shows the port nacelle and deflector dish. I find it a little revealing and it does take some of the shine off the big reveal a few moments later. But even with this in, it's still delicious. Just pure starship porn and the enhanced visuals really help pop the model even more. I will always love this. Kirk meets his old crewmates Uhura, Sulu and Chekhov on the bridge before heading to engineering to meet with Decker, who doesn't know he's to be relieved of command. Decker, a confident officer who has overseen the Enterprise's transformation, is visibly upset upon learning the news, accusing Kirk of using the emerging situation to take back the ship. Kirk retains Decker's services as an executive officer, who storms off right as an alarm sounds, indicating a malfunction with an active transporter beam. Kirk races to Janice Rand, who is operating the transporter, attempting to beam Sonak and another officer aboard. They attempt to abort the beam, 
but it's too late. Distorting and screaming, the two disappear, their deaths confirmed by Starfleet moments later. The less said about the real life actor the better, but the character of Decker made for an excellent foil for Kirk. Age and obsession weren't just facets of the rough of Khan and the search for Spock, those threads were actually picked out here, although admittedly the payoff isn't quite as strong. The transporter scene scared the crap out of me as a kid, and I'm sure it probably did you too, and remains a chilling visual sequence to this day. No wonder McCoy was so hesitant to use the technology. Kirk assembles the crew to show them what they're up against and receive a transmission from the monitoring station. The station officer reveals the vast size and sheer power of the cloud, but the station scans are perceived as hostile and the cloud swiftly consumes the station. Kirk hastens pre-launch and dismisses the crew. Lieutenant Ilea, the Enterprise's Delta navigator, arrives for duty and introduces herself to Kirk and the crew. Ilea and Decker reunite, having been in a relationship several years prior. Kirk heads back to the transporter room, which is now working, to welcome aboard a bearded Leonard McCoy, who is far from pleased to have been reactivated, or drafted as he calls it. The inclusion of Percy's Kambata as the Delta Ilea adds layers to what has been a pretty clinical showing so far. I do wish Kambata had been directed to play Ilea with a little more warmth and depth of emotion though, as this would have enhanced her scenes later on. Less a fault with a talented and dearly missed actress, and more just a missed opportunity on the director's part. With the crew assembled and some of the ship's issues resolved, the Enterprise powers up and departs dry dock. The ship's warp engines are untested, but Kirk orders warp speed to intercept the cloud as soon as possible. The Enterprise goes to warp, but is immediately caught in a wormhole along with an asteroid which threatens to destroy the ship. Kirk orders phasers, but his order is overruled by Decker, who orders photon torpedoes instead. The torpedo is successful, saving the ship from destruction at the very last second. Publicly undermined, Kirk demands Decker meet with him privately. In his quarters, Kirk demands to know from Decker why his order was countered. Decker reveals that due to the Enterprise's new power system, phasers would have been ineffective. Kirk concedes that Decker saved the ship, but the two are still at odds. McCoy, also in the room, accuses Kirk of using the Admiral to get back command, adding he believes it has become an obsession for the Admiral. The two are interrupted by Ahura and Chekhov, who reveal a shuttle is requesting permission to dock. Over 40 years later, and the wormhole scene still elicits a bit of a mixed reaction. Visually, it's quite remarkable, with distorted multi-colour streaks bending and weaving around the actors. I have no idea how they pulled off these visuals, uh, but they look great to this day. I can see what they were attempting to do with the space-time distortions, but the slowing actions and audio comes across, to me anyway, as <laughs> unintentionally hilarious, particularly everything Chekhov says. The shuttle's occupant is revealed as Spock, who reunites with his crewmate on the bridge. His old colleagues, including McCoy and Dr. Chapel, are delighted to see him, but Spock, more distant and cold than before, ignores their platitudes, offering his services as science officer and to help Scotty rebalance the warp engines. Spock and Scotty quickly get the Enterprise to warp capacity, allowing the Enterprise to more quickly intercept the cloud. Meeting with Kirk and McCoy, Spock reveals breaking his Colinar training after sensing the consciousness of the cloud, believing its perfect, logical form patterns will give him the answers he seeks. The first proper sit-down scene with the original show's primary characters is in true perfect keeping with Trek's cerebral best. Tying Spock to the mysterious intruder as teased earlier is an interesting development, one of the most interesting aspects of this story. The Enterprise arrives at the cloud, which immediately scans the ship. Kirk orders no scans in return, hoping to avoid the monitoring station's fate. Spock determines the scans are coming from the centre of the cloud and surmises its incredible power. The cloud attacks the Enterprise with bolts of plasma energy that overload systems. Spock reveals the cloud has been attempting to communicate with a frequency unrecognisable to humans and reprograms the computer to send a response which saves the ship from a second wave of attack. Kirk orders the Enterprise on a course to the centre of the cloud. Travelling through layers of cloud, the Enterprise eventually reaches a vast and powerful vessel at its core. The vessel probes the Enterprise and attempts to access the ship's computer, which Spock prevents by smashing a terminal. The probe then turns its attention towards Ilea, who the probe seemingly disintegrates. The vessel then ensnares the Enterprise in a tractor beam, pulling the ship inside. Spock deduces that the alien is curious, reasoning that that's why it has not yet destroyed them. An intruder alert sounds, drawing Kirk and Spock to crew quarters. Something the motion picture does excellently, but never seems to get the credit for, is its incredible attention to scale. Its visual sequences are slow and drawn out, yes, but it's now clear that they're intended this way to establish true scale. Kirk and Scott shuttle looks 
tiny compared to the Enterprise's shiny new hull, while here the same ship is completely dwarfed by the sheer mass of the intruder vessel. This is another reason to love the director's edition, because the original cut never really achieved the full realisation of Vija's exterior. The crew have already mentioned Vija's power and scales, but these visuals do a much better job of conveying the threat and cementing the stakes. Kirk and Spock discover the intruder is a recreation of Ilea sent by Vija to observe the carbon-based lifeforms infesting the Enterprise, and that Vija is heading to Earth wishing to join with the creator. Scans reveal Ilea is a perfect recreation of the original, right down to the smallest detail. On Decker's arrival, the Ilea probe appears to recognise him, leading Spock to theorise that Vija may have copied her memories as well. Kirk convinces Decker to reconnect with the Ilea probe to try and learn more about the alien, which is rapidly approaching Earth. With the help of McCoy and Dr. Chapel, Decker attempts to awaken some humanity in the Ilea probe, convincing it to experience some of Ilea's memories to help it understand the carbon units and their functions. For a moment, the probe shows emotion, recalling Ilea's past relationship with Decker, but upon questioning, returns back to its emotionless state. Meanwhile, Spock steals a spacesuit and leaves the ship in an attempt to make contact. Thrusting further inside the alien vessel, Spock encounters perfect recreations of planets, ships, space stations, and finally Ilea. Spock theorises that what he's seeing is a visual representation of Vija's journey, before attempting to meld with the representation of Ilea. However, the experience is too much, and Spock is knocked back to the Enterprise unconscious, where he's rescued by Kirk. In Sick Bay, an emotional Spock reveals his findings. Vija is a sentient being from a distant planet populated by living machines. Vija is armed with all the knowledge in the universe, but lacks emotions to give meaning to its actions actions. Spock draws comparisons to Vija in his own pursuit of logical perfection, speculating the alien is questioning, wanting to know if there is nothing more to its existence. Crucial scenes as the mystery slowly begins to unravel. The tragedy of the replacement of Ilea with a cybernetic doppelganger is oddly downplayed, but subsequent scenes make up for it somewhat with Decker attempting to use his love for Ilea to get through to the probe. The conflict within the Ilea probe is there, but very subtle. Again, something that could have been enhanced with a slightly different different performance by Combatter earlier, perhaps. Spock's exploration of Vija's interior is another standout visual moment, a sequence clearly influenced by Stanley Kubrick's seminal 2001 A Space Odyssey, which does make sense given special effects were handled by the same team. Robert Wise gave Douglas Tremble a wide latitude with the visuals, and that faith paid off beautifully, with an incredibly rich experience. After the fast-paced, fun adventures of Star Wars, it was a ballsy move to go with something like this. I'm glad they did. I honestly think if 2001 never happened, this movie would be far more widely revered for its visuals than it is today. Vija arrives at Earth, its massive cloud dissipating as it nears orbit. Starfleet reveals Vija is transmitting a radio signal, its attempt to contact the creator. Not receiving a response, Vija positions energy orbs around the planet, rendering its defence system useless in the process. The Ilea probe states the orbs are there to remove the planet's carbon unit infestation, which Vija believes is preventing the creator from responding. The crew realise Vija expects the creator to be like itself, a machine. The crew reason with the Ilea probe, with Kirk promising to disclose the information Vija demands if it removes the destructive orbs from orbit. The Ilea probe agrees, and the Enterprise is pulled towards a central complex that is rapidly filling with an oxygen atmosphere. Another new effect shot here helps add more definition to the Vija vessel. This may be a controversial opinion, but I didn't really like this. Uh, I found it a bit too colourful and stood out too much as a new addition to the version. I much prefer Vija looking dark and mysterious, and, and always found the ship to have an almost Giga-esque vibe. This new shot, unfortunately, just didn't do it for me. As a failsafe, Kirk puts Starfleet Order 2005, the end Enterprise's auto-destruct on standby and heads to the central complex with Spock, McCoy, Decker and the Ilea probe. Arriving at the complex, the landing party discover an old probe which Kirk identifies as Voyager 6, an ancient Earth probe. Voyager 6 was lost through a black hole, which the crew assume must have emerged on the other side of the galaxy and was repurposed with advanced technology to complete its mission. Kirk calls up the probe's old NASA code to complete transmission, but Vija suddenly destroys its own antenna 
to prevent reception. The team realise Vija wants to evolve beyond its original mission and needs the creator, a human, to accomplish that goal. The Alia probe repeats Vija's design to join with the creator and Decker offers himself. Kirk attempts to stop him, but Decker tells Kirk he wants this as much as Kirk wants the Enterprise. Bright lights form around Decker's body as the Ilea probe moves in. The two merge into a new life form as the lights begin to expand outwards. The remaining landing party return to the Enterprise as Vija explodes, leaving the ship and Earth unharmed. It got a little busy and borderline convoluted for a second, but what a wonderful climax this was. The truth behind Vija's origins is an awesome twist and such a great hard sci-fi concept that never fails to get me thinking about our real Voyager probes that have now long departed our own solar system. Where in the universe are these probes and could this actually happen for real someday? We also get some warmth here in the Decker and Ilya merger, but it's still a little lacking. Their love story was incredibly scored musically, but everything else fell a little flat for me unfortunately. But despite that the idea of the two combining to create a new life form is very hard sci-fi trek and again never fails to stir up my imagination. I guess that's the real romantic core of this movie. One quick final moan though, the visual of Vija disintegrating in the new director's edition looked it looked pretty rubbish. It's easily the worst effect shot of the new edition. Back on the bridge of the Enterprise, Kirk, Spock and McCoy and the crew speculate on what they've just seen. The possible birth of a brand new form of existence. Kirk requests to Starfleet that Decker and Ilea be listed as missing and orders the Enterprise to head out there, that away, as the ship warps away to start a brand new adventure. I don't remember ever disliking the motion picture, but as I've grown older and gotten more enjoyment from understanding how something is made, I've come to love this movie far more than I ever did. This used to be something that I'd only watch every few years or so, and even then I'd need to be in a particular mood. But now, perhaps due to modern Star Trek's faster pace, emphasis on pew-pews and lack of scientific focus, I do find myself needing the motion picture more and more as a powerful reminder of just how stimulating Star Trek can be as a visual spectacle as well as something to inspire. Is it perfect? I don't think so. It's a visual masterpiece with one of cinema's all-time great musical scores, but like Spock in the earlier stages of the story, the film is incredibly dry, cold and distant, and fails to properly utilise its power trio despite the powerful mystery offering a great opportunity to play to Kirk, Spock and McCoy's strengths. It's that crucial mishandling that will always hold this movie down for me. Robert Wise, as great a filmmaker as he was, was probably the wrong person to direct such a feature. Feature. At the end of the day, they went for a marquee name when really they needed someone who truly understood the essence and appeal of Star Trek. Forget what you've heard before. No more slow motion picture labels, please. Slow is the new cool after all. This is an underappreciated visual spectacle that needs to be experienced on the biggest screen possible. A must watch for anyone wanting an antidote for the light year a second frills of modern sci-fi. This is a slow and cerebral experience. Star Trek at its absolute sci-fi best. I'm giving Star Trek The Motion Picture four stars out of five. What did you think of Star Trek The Motion Picture? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Let me know in the comments below and please like this video and subscribe to the channel for more Star Trek reviews and recaps coming soon. Until next time, I'm the Trek Lad. Live long and prosper.